thanks everybody for coming and I hope everybody's enjoying the uh, dino bites and um, all the fun dinosaur stuff. Um, special thanks to the museum for putting this together and inviting me out here. I love coming to Utah at all time periods, even with the hot summer and the cold winter. So it's one of my favorite places to be. Um, today, for this little dynabite, I'm going to talk actually about chemistry and big bag chemistry. Everybody hates chemistry. Oh my god, chemistry class in high school was awful. I hated chemistry in high school. Um, and then somehow I turned into a geochemist. So, um, and I think part of that is because of my love of paleontology. Um, I was given a paper actually by Lindsay Zano's husband on trace element geochemistry in fossils. Um, and I read it and I was like, oh, well that's kind of cool. You can look at bones and teeth and tell a little bit about how a fossil got to be where it was. Um, and so now I've started using geochemistry and it was kind of my breakthrough moment of understanding chemistry is by applying it to the past. So as you know, Utah has an amazing fossil record and this is downstairs, the really cool Ceratopsian phylogenetic tree. Um, and Utah has an amazing fossil record from throughout the Mesozoic, the time period that the dinosaurs were alive. Um, they exist, we have stuff from St. George like um, Andrew Milner was talking to us about. Um, we have lots of Jurassic dinosaurs like Allosaurus, which is a state fossil. Um, Utah Ceratops from the Cretaceous down to the Kaparowitz and stuff that um, Alan Titus was talking to us about. And so all these fossils are really amazing to look at, to study the biology of the animals themselves, their physiology and like their biomechanics. But what I study is actually the chemistry of these things. And um, actually the chemistry tells us a lot about the animal itself and also about the environment itself. So there's a lot of information locked in the chemistry of teeth and bones. So what I do, and actually you can see this is a a theropod tooth from the Cedar Mountain Formation and you can actually see this down in the Cedar Mountain Formation displays downstairs and you can actually even see the grooves that I left behind. So that was my fault, I did that and I am sorry. Um, but we got some really good information from it. And so I drill these samples, I generate a powder, sometimes I do some fun chemistry stuff to the powder and I run it on a mass spectrometer, in this case an isotope ratio mass spectrometer um, to tell us various things about the animal. So when I'm talking about chemistry for this talk, I'm going to be talking about stable isotopes. So stable isotopes, what are stable isotopes? These are simply atoms of the same element with different amounts of neutrons within the nucleus. So if you have your nucleus with protons and neutrons and circulating around that or your electrons. And we're interested in um, various atoms with different amounts of neutrons on the inside of the nucleus. And so these different neutrons cause different masses of those different elements. And so if you have more neutrons, um, then you are heavier. So in this case, this is oxygen isotope. Um, oxygen has eight protons in it. Um, and typically eight neutrons, but sometimes it can have 10 neutrons in it, in which case it's oxygen 18, eight plus 10 is 18, um, and so you get oxygen 18. And these mass differences cause what uh, geochemists call fractionation, or basically a mass discrimination of the different types of stable isotopes. And these mass discriminations occur predictably when you have physical changes between like a liquid and a gas or chemical changes or biological processes like an animal eating a plant, taking it into its body and uh, making energy out of it. Um, another way to describe stable isotopes is like looking at different types of milk. You have skim milk, which doesn't have any fat in it. Um, you have 2% milk and you have whole milk, right? Um, and these different contents of fat, if you will, are kind of like different masses. Um, skim milk is your light milk, whole milk is your, like your heavy milk, right? Um, so it's kind of like the different flavors of your different elements. Oxygen has three flavors, 16, 17, and 18. Uh, carbon has three flavors, 12, 13, and 14. We mostly look at 12 and 13 because 14 is radiogenic, which means it radioactively decays. And then another thing to remember is that it's easier to move lighter isotopes than it is to move heavier isotopes. Um, and this is where the bowling balls and the ping pong balls come into play. It's kind of like having to move a bowling ball versus a ping pong ball. So we're going to do a demonstration that I've never done before, but I've had this idea to do it before. And we're going to have a race with a ping pong ball and a bowling ball <laughs> and see if this works. So what we're going to do, we need 
will give you the ping pong ball. I'm gonna make you guys have the bowling ball. <laughs> um, and so when I say go, we're gonna pass it down the row and back. We're gonna not drop the bowling ball on somebody's toe. <laughs> we're not gonna drop the ping pong ball because that'll probably mess up the whole demonstration. So when I say go, you're gonna pass it down and bring it back and we're gonna see which one makes it here first. And theoretically, the ping pong ball should make it here first. So uh, no cheating, on your marks, get set, go. <laughs> <laughs> all the way down, no, all the way down, all the way down. <laughs> oh, good job, good job. Yay, and ping pong ball one. <laughs> Keep it going, we'll let second place get back. <laughs> Or take it back to slow pokes. <laughs> no, you're good. Okay, so easier, right? It's easier to move a ping pong ball than a bowling ball. And the same thing is true with isotopes. It's easier to move the lighter isotopes than the heavier isotopes. And this comes into play when we look at the isotopes in dinosaur bones. Um, so uh, the isotopes that I mostly look at are carbon and oxygen, and the reason, and I will tell you why, is because one, oxygen and carbon are composed in dinosaur teeth and bone. They're composed, they're, they're part of our teeth and bone. Uh, teeth and bone are made up of calcium, phosphorus, oxygen, carbon, and hydrogen. Um, the other thing to remember is that you are what you eat and drink. If you're gonna be drinking a whole lot of whole milk, you might be a little bit heavier than somebody that's drinking a whole lot of skim milk, right? Um, and so oxygen is a proxy, what we call a proxy for water. It tells us a little bit about the isotopic composition of water. Carbon is a proxy for the isotopic composition of the food that you eat. And in the case of plant eaters, the isotopic composition of plants. That's also important. These different things, water and diet, are controlled by the environment. Um, you know, is it hot, is it cold, is it wet, is it dry? And so when we can analyze these isotopes in teeth, um, over time, we can see how the environment has changed over time. Um, so for oxygen, and for this talk specifically, we're interested in the hydrologic cycle. Oxygen is a proxy for water. Um, and you can see here the Himalayan mountains, here's India, uh, here are the very nice tropical uh, climates with lots of plants. Uh, south of the mountain. And one of the things that you can see also north of the mountains is it's brown and dry. This is the Tibetan Plateau. It's a desert. There's not much uh, plant life up there. And this is because of the mountains. So when you have a big mountain popping up, um, as air moisture moves up the mountain, the uh, water vapor within the air condenses and creates clouds and then you rain out and then Eventually, if your mountain is high enough, the moisture can't get onto the other side of the mountain and you get what's called a rain shadow. And that's what's happening here. You have a rain shadow and you have no water making it up, very little water making it up into the Tibetan Plateau. So we can track this with stable isotopes. Like I said, it's easier to move lighter isotopes than heavier isotopes. So if you start off with equal amounts of bowling balls and ping pong balls and you evaporate uh, the water and you recondense it, you start to lose your heavy isotopes or your bowling balls, right? And so you start to concentrate your air, your, your water, your um, air moisture in the lighter isotopes or the ping pong balls. Streams that feed these heavier, these uh, light isotopic waters, or basically the, we're talking about rain now, Streams that are coming from higher up in the mountains will be lighter in isotopic composition because that's the isotopic composition of the rain up here. And then on the other side of the mountains, uh, any water that does get over there or moisture from other uh, moisture patterns uh, begin to get enriched in isotopic composition or concentrated in the bowling balls because again, it's easier to move lighter isotopes and heavier isotopes. So the lighter isotopes preferentially get caught up into the vapor phase or air water vapor and the heavier isotopes remain in the liquid phase as liquid water. 
similar thing happens with carbon isotopes um, in plant leaves. In their cells, CO2 moves in and out of their cells. And in dry climates, it's easier move to move CO2 with the lighter isotope connected to it out of the cell and concentrate the heavier isotopes within the cell. And so heavier carbon isotopic composition plants um, are related or correlative to drier climates. Uh, similarly for wet, you don't get as much mass discrimination and so um, they tend to be lighter in carbon isotopic composition. And we can relate this to this precipitation uh, by putting an equation to a line by, by relating the two. And we can relate it to the mean annual precipitation or the average rainfall in a year. So when you have lots of heavier isotopes, it's usually drier, less precipitation. When you have light isotopes, it's usually um, uh, more precipitation. So what does this have to do with Utah? Um, so this is Utah and the Cretaceous, and one of the things that happens in the Cretaceous is you have the severe mountains rising up in western part of the state. Um, and you would have moisture, the Pacific westerlies coming in, um, bringing moisture into the continent, um, and they would hit this mountain range and start to rain out. The other thing that's happening in the Cretaceous uh, is the western interior seaway is beginning to flood the continental interior and this is a seaway that by uh, the later part of the mid Cretaceous had filled in and separated North America into two different um, continents. Um, so to do this study I looked at fauna from the Cedar Mountain Formation and this is an old, old one. Jim's going to show you a new one that's way better than that one. Um, and I separated these into four main groups, the lower yellow cat member, which is the oldest, the upper yellow cat, the ruby ranch, and then the mustn't touch it, which is some of the stuff that um, Lindsay was talking about earlier yesterday. And I borrowed materials graciously from BYU, this institution here at the University, at the, the Utah Museum of Natural History, the College of Eastern Utah now, Utah State, uh, also Oklahoma, gave me some material and, and the Denver Museum gave me material. So I have to have a shout out to those guys. Um, this is where we found most of the material. A lot of this material is from Grand County and a lot from Emory County. Most of the muzz and touch stuff is out here in Emory County. And this is their stratigraphic distribution. And so let's just go to results. Um, you don't have to know what the numbers mean per se. All you need to know is that on these four graphs we have four representative dinosaur groups that I grouped most of the data from. Uh, lower down on the y-axis is the oldest and then the youngest. So we have oldest to youngest, oldest to youngest. And then on the x-axis we have lighter to heavy. Um, so lighter isotopes, lots of ping pong balls, to heavier isotopes, lots of bowling balls. And so what I want you to focus on more are the trends. And one of the first trends that you see is this increase in isotopic composition. And I suggest, this is some of the stuff I did for my dissertation, I suggested that this was the first impacts of the severe mountains being uplifted in western Utah. And we start to get a rain shadow and increase in the isotopic composition. So we're getting a rain shadow, it's getting drier, and we're concentrating the bowling balls. Um, and then we see this big decrease in, during the Ruby Ranch member time, which kind of confused me. Um, but going back and looking through tectonics papers, I realized that maybe what we're seeing here is the effects of high altitude precipitation and maybe even seasonal snow uh, occurring in the severe mountains. And if those um, high elevation rain and snow gets melted into the rivers and drained into the basin, there will be very light and isotopic composition if the dinosaurs are drinking that water. And then, uh, unfortunately, most of my, these guys didn't show up as there's not a whole lot of sauropods in the mustn't touch it, but we get this increase in the ornithischian groups um, of isotopic composition, which I suggested is the result of the incursion of the Western Interior Seaway and return of moisture to this um, area. So less um, um, orographic effect or less uh, distillation of just the light isotopes because now we have the western interior seaway very close by and providing moisture to the area. Um, so this is just for oxygen isotopes. I had one of my students once I graduated and finally got a job and look at the carbon isotopes because I didn't get a chance to do the carbon isotopes when I was working on my dissertation. And so these are the results again older to younger um, and lighter to heavier. And just for simplicity's sake, I just converted that to mean annual precipitation. And so here's the amount of rain per year. 
And what we see again is a decrease in precipitation as you get into the rain shadow. And then an overall increase as you um, see the incursion of the Western Interior Seaway and you increase your, iso uh, your mean annual precipitation. So to a certain extent, the carbon isotopes are also um, supporting the oxygen isotope data that I collected from my dissertation. So just to go over kind of this progression where this is kind of a block diagram of what the area would have looked like. All the animals were living out here. Uh, we had the paleo westerlies come in this way. Then in the upper yellow cat, we had a big uplift of, this is the canyon range thrust of the severe mountains. And so the first big elevation change and a range shadow forming here. Um, we uh, see aridity or a decrease in precipitation and an increase in the oxygen isotopic composition, so more evaporation. Um, and then I suggest here in the Ruby Ranch member time, there's enough elevation to create um, at least seasonal uh, precip uh, frozen precipitation and drainage. Into the and then as we get into Muss and Touch at member time, the Western Interior Seaway has now encroached into the area. Moisture now comes from the Western Interior Seaway and is raining here rather than the Paleo Westerlies providing moisture into this area. And so as a result, we get increased isotopic composition of oxygen. We get a, a, a decrease in the isotopic composition of carbon and an increase of mean annual precipitation. Uh, so just to summarize, isotopes are like different flavors of the same elements or different types of milk, right? Skim, 2% heavy. And this mass discrimination um, causes isotopes, uh, or this, this mass difference causes isotopes to discriminate itself via their mass. So think bowling balls versus ping pong balls. And then when it comes to isotopes in vertebrates or any type of fossil that we can analyze for isotopes, you are what you eat and drink, isotopically speaking. And so isotopes analyzed from dinosaur teeth and bones can help us determine what the environment was like when they existed. Um, for the Cedar Mountain Formation, carbon isotopes um, analyzed from dinosaurs record the changing regional climate during this time period. And that changing regional, regional climate was in part controlled by the rise of the severe mountains in western Utah, as well as the incursion of the western interior seaway. And then the next thing we're looking at is looking at how global climate effects, uh, how we can separate these regional climatic effects from global climatic effects. So that's some of the stuff that I'm working on um, in the future. Uh, and I have to, I forgot to add, add acknowledgement, so I feel bad, but I have to thank all of the institutions that donated materials uh, to my study, like the, University, uh, the Utah Museum, Denver Museum, um, CEU Museum, uh, Oklahoma Museum. Thank my students who helped run some of my samples, um, and all of you for being here and the organizers of DinoFest. So any questions, please? <laughs> Mystery questions? Yeah, there, there probably were seasonal. You, just like today, you get you get moisture coming up from like the Gulf, but the Gulf was pretty far away, and it was more of like a paleo Gulf of Mexico. You also had stuff coming from further south along the Pacific, but predominantly from other studies, most of the moisture was coming from the westerlies from the Pacific, because the coast was a lot closer back then too, um, to where it is today. So. Um, but by the western, by, by like the, the later part of the Cedar Mountain Formation and then the overlying formations like the Natarita and such, the, the western interior seaway was already starting to encroach and, and that's when you started getting this interesting dynamic that we really haven't had a chance to dis, like study as well, at least out in Laramidia, um, between the interaction of the moisture coming from the paleo westerly, paleo, yeah, the paleo westerlies and moisture moving up and down the western interior seaway. There's a lot of isotope studies of, of marine rocks from the western interior seaway and about how circulation may have happened. And so we can infer that from the water circulation at that time. Um, most of my trace element stuff it was stuff that I did at Cleveland Lloyd and I've done a few trace element things on the Cedar Mountain Formation um, and I believe Clive Truman's done a bit. Um, they're all fairly, high, bones at least are all fairly highly concentrated in trace elements which is part of the reason why we tend to try to use teeth and not bones because bone, bone 
appetite is a lot more prone to diagenesis and you can track that by looking at trace elements in, in, in bone, uh, which is, so this is the reason why we tend to use teeth, but teeth tend to be very valued and people don't like giving up teeth for destructive analysis. Um, but we only do little scratches, they're not that bad, so. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I've done a little bit of trace element stuff on that and various other places though. Oh yeah, so so the carbonized tub data, the, the error bars are really wide because um, when my grad student did those did those samples, he kind of messed up on some of them, and so the sample size isn't very big. I need to do some more sampling on that. But well, for the mustn't touch it, I had lots of stuff because I had a lot of micro stuff. So you know anywhere between 15 to 20 samples per like dinosaur group. But for the other samples, it was more like between five and 10, not nearly like the 20 or 30 I could get from the must and touch it. But sometimes you could only work with what you have. And so a lot of times what I try to do is um, rather than sampling a bunch of different teeth, you can sample the same tooth multiple times to get the variability, like the seasonal variability within the tooth. Um, so if you only have three teeth, if you sample those three teeth like 15 times each, you can get an idea of what the variability would be f for that animal, so. Uh, there's so much stuff. Some of the some of the stuff that um, I would be really interested in, I know um, people have done it in the past, is calcium isotope work. And calcium isotope is a good trophic indicator. Um, uh, Thomas Tutkin in Germany is doing a lot of that stuff, and people have done it in the past. It's just the um, uh, technology to do it was a little bit difficult and the price for samples was a bit steep, but that price is coming down as more and more people have like TIMS and multi-collectors and stuff like that. The other really cool things are looking at some of the other heavy metals, isotopes of the other heavy metals like iron and zinc and copper. Um, these are all part essential parts of body function and they can all fractionate in certain ways um, that have it can be predictable and tell us different um, information about these animals, so. Yeah, there's, that's a big part of work that people do when they're trying to do this stuff is do ground truthing where you have some controlled experiments with animals, you feed them food or give them water to drink that you know the isotopic composition and you look at the fractionation that occurs. Um, so, like for example, Thomas is doing right now a big study on calcium isotopes and he has a bunch of different animals that he's feeding them food with known calcium isotopic composition, um, unfortunately killing them and then analyzing the isotopes. But And, and, and so people have done this more in controlled experiments. Uh, carn carnivorous animals are harder to work with. Um, in the wild, obviously, you're not just gonna go up to a croc and say, can I borrow your tooth, please? Um, and so the carnivore, carnivore isotopes are a little bit harder to work with. There's not as much ground truthing with them because pretty much you can only work with stuff that's like in zoos and stuff like that. Oh, I, I, I did some calculations, laparoscopic calculations with oxygen isotopes and I calculated between uh, 2.5 to three kilometers high. Some people have suggested higher using clumped isotope methods. Um, so as much as like three kilometers high, so pretty high. And it was more like a high plateau. People call it like the Nevada Plano, kind of like the Alta Plano in, in South America. So I'll take some more questions out there. <laughs>